Right, my name's Amy McDonald. Um, I work for a company called Thornton Tomasetti, and I'm here on behalf of myself and Suana Fabian, who is a disastrous management expert. Hopefully I've got some slides too, um, at Isra Aid. Right, so we're gonna be talking about the road to resilience, considering safe homes, safe schools, two examples uh, from Puerto Rico and Dominica. Uh, both suffered terribly in the 2017 hurricane season. So, Harvey, Irma, Maria barreled through, causing a, um, a huge amount of damage as they went through the Caribbean. First, Dominica uh, with Maria. Uh, Sawana was there herself to experience this, um, along with many other people. We had 86% of the schools were damaged um, in Dominica and 90% of the houses. Um, as Maria continued on to Puerto Rico, uh, the damage continued. We had, um, we had schools, houses, communications, roads cut. Um, we also had a lot of damage to, um, to the power network, um, all of which have disrupted the lives and lives of people and businesses um, and the economies in those areas. Um, so, the things that we're going to be talking about is how we actually can avoid that in the future. Um, we're going to be specifically looking at the impact and considering the different types of risks, not just the event that occurred last time, Maria, Irma, definitely storm surge, hurricane events, but what about the other events like landslides, the other risks that, um, that are, um, exist. So while they were each disasters in their own right, um, disasters are not natural. Um, hurricanes, floods, they are natural hazards, but it is actually our lack of um, capacity to be able to deal with those that is, the, that is the disaster, not the hazard itself. Each of those bring about opportunities, um, opportunities to build on historic um, momentum that we have, build strong partnerships, and to build resilience in our communities. So that's opportunities to prepare, to do better next time, to take the lessons from the past, um, consider the other risks that, that our communities face, and to prepare for the constantly changing world we have. Um, none of this would be possible without, uh, without collaboration. It's collaboration with leaders, community leaders, governments, uh, funders, all sorts of um, experts who are able to bring their, um, their learnings and lessons from other places. We're going, Sawana is going to be sharing with us about the uh, Safe School Program in Dominica. Uh, she's going to be talking about the efforts of the Ministry of Education to increase the, and strengthen the ability of the um, uh, Ministry of Education to prepare for events and prepare the people for events. So just as Her Honourable um, Prime Minister mentioned students and kids are a great way for us to start changing the culture. Um, in Dominica, they've had great success with 73 of the schools now have emergency operations plans. Um, they're involving their school, each of the children in um, actually identifying what the hazards are, the vulnerabilities and the capacities, um, taking it right down to uh, early childhood um, education, so providing the information in a really simple simple way to understand um, so that that we can start a change in culture rather than um, just bringing it from the top down. Um, here you can see we've got some kids with their emergency kit that they've started to um, use. Uh, so in Puerto Rico um, we have also been working with the government a very collaborative effort with um, under the leadership of Enterprise Community Partners working with the Department of Housing, the local Home Builders Association, uh, the local universities to create a guide for resilient housing uh, design and construction. So looking at first with um, considering all the different risks that a house face, faces, um, looking at climate change and how that's going to impact the community in the future and how we can uh, consider construction and engineering measures. Also looking at energy and uh, water just as Prime Minister hit all my points actually. Um, so looking at the way that we can uh, really improve with more innovative, resilient and sustainable solutions for our housing going forward. So I'll leave you with this, when the unfavourable conditions um, are upon us, the pessimist sits on the beach and complains about the wind, the optimist expects it to change and the realist adjusts their kite. 
I think it's up to us to adjust our kite. Um, so I'd like you all to come along to our session tomorrow, 2.30, um, come and learn more and be part of the, part of the solution. Thank you. How do you deal with uncertainty? How does it feel? And let's say you're a decision maker in the Caribbean. I know most of them are at the press conference now, but you have decision to take not only for yourself, but for your citizens. So let's play a game. I want you to pick a number from one to six right now in your head. And when we roll the dice, if the number you picked is chosen, that means that a hurricane category four is going to happen in your country. So who picked the number four? All right, now you know. It reduces the level of uncertainty. And yet, what do you do now? What decision will you take? What investments are you going to make first, given the small budget you were allocated this year? Maybe you already have an early warning protocols. But however, how confident are you that this protocol is understandable by all the chain of actors that will have to implement it? So. What you really need, in fact, is the right information on time. So maybe you want to invest in new station, or you want to train your meteorologist, or maybe you want to have this high-tech new platform. But be careful, because you also need to be sure your population is prepared, and you need to pay attention to details here. For example, you need to make sure this volunteer here from the DPC is having batteries in his megaphone. Also, you want to make sure this message is conveyed to the most vulnerable of your citizens and to your most remote area, or are you going to do that? You want to make sure that communities are empowered because they might as well spend days without you being able to send any kind of help. So how do you make sure your first responders are able to face a disaster? And in that matter, you want to pay special attention to women. You want to make sure women get the message, understand the message, are able to protect their kids. You want to make sure they feel safe when they enter the shelters. By the way, do you have shelters in the area at risk? So in a nutshell, what you need is um, an effective, risk-informed, gender-sensitive, people-centered, and impact-based early warning system, whatever that means. And in our session, we're going to go over those terms, and we're going to try to describe the perfect early warning system as symbolized here. And as you can see, people are really in the center of met information, risk information, communication, preparedness, and response. So now is the right time to talk about the CRUISE initiative. First, because the diagram was taken from their website. And in our session, you're going to learn about what the cruise is and what it can do for you. Also, you'll hear about the Cruise Caribbean, a project that was launched last November here in Barbados, which more specifically focused on Caribbean country and how we can support early warning system in the Caribbean. So during the two interactive sessions from the cruise, you will have the opportunity to discuss with donors and stakeholders and talk about what you think the priorities are in the Caribbean in terms of investments, so that next time when you roll the dice, you will have a better idea of what you can do in a context of scarce resources and decision to make. So please, I invite you to two sessions. One is happening on Wednesday. It's an interactive technical session sponsored by the crews. And it's going to happen at 2 p.m. But also, you don't want to miss the workshop that's going to be held on Thursday, because this workshop is sponsored by the Cruise Caribbean. And it's also a first step in a consultation process so that you can express what you think the gaps we need to fill. The two sessions are sponsored by the Cruise, with implementing partners being World Met Organization, 
World Bank, GFDRR, and UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. So if there are two sessions you don't want to miss, make them the cruise initiative session. So this is an opportunity for you to speak out and talk about what you think your priorities are. Thank you very much. I am very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to see all of you here um, for an important discussion over the next few days on understanding risk in a Caribbean context. Understanding risk means you have to understand the situation, the framework within which those risks evolve. Many of you, all of you from the region, know pertinently well what that context is and the acuteness of the risks you face. You ask yourselves many questions that we do not ask ourselves in Europe. It wouldn't cross my mind, or those, most of my compatriots, to ask myself if once we reach the autumn, once we reach the end of October, my house would still be standing. I assume it will be. Or whether everything I've worked for in my lifetime might be literally blown away in a few hours. You in the Caribbean don't have that luxury. You face risks every year, during every hurricane season. You wonder what to expect this year. Wonder which island might be hit this time. How fierce nature will be, or whether it will give you a break. It's difficult for me, for us as Europeans, to find the right words to express with a due degree of humility our admiration for your resilience, for your efforts at building better resilience in uh, the Caribbean, in this part of the world. Let's be clear, we all pay in different ways um, our dues to climate change. We've had a number, an increasing number of storms and floods and fires and excessive cold in Europe over the last few years. We've had to come together to find new European ways of handling that. You will hear more about that from um, State Secretary Arafat tomorrow. But the severity of the events we face pale in comparison to the extreme challenges, at least for now, to the, com compared to the extreme challenges that you face here. Uh, facing risk and acknowledging it is one thing. Assessing it, coping with it, preparing for it, and thereby eventually taming it, finding a way of handling it, is quite another. I'm very proud that the European Union contributes to the organization of this useful initiative of the World Bank and the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery in the Caribbean. The fact that we are here today, prime ministers, ministers, officials, entrepreneurs, students, activists, analysts, all together, speaks for itself. We are all concerned by the risks that we are facing, that you are facing, and we all want to understand them better to see how we can work together to mitigate them, to prepare for them, to reduce their impact. This initiative is also an expression of the multilateral approach to global issues, an approach that the European Union strongly supports on the world stage. Without working together, we cannot hope to achieve the results, to have the impact we would like for ourselves or with our partners. Understanding risk is the first priority of the so-called Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And we are pleased to inform you that the EU has already been working on the implementation of its 2016 action plan, action plan on that Sendai framework, 
promoting through our external cooperation instruments a number of elements. Like, for instance, risk-informed investments in partner countries, the use of different mechanisms for disaster risk financing, risk transfer and insurance or ecosystem-based approaches to disaster risk reduction. That's a good start, but it's far from being enough. The concept of understanding risk in its largest sense has to be embedded throughout our societies, in education, in legislation, in everyone's mindset, in our economic activities and other parts of our everyday life. People everywhere should understand the risk of not respecting building norms, of not preparing in time for possible disasters, of cutting down forests, of wasting food and water, or of using disposable plastics that would clog up our nature, our seas, our water systems, our drains. National and local governments, private sector partners, civil society, local communities and even households should all be empowered to become proactive risk managers and therefore effectively build resilience at all levels. The European Union is and will remain strongly committed to supporting the Caribbean region in building resilience at all levels. That resilience is at the core of the EU global strategy, which is our guiding framework document on our foreign policy and external cooperation action. It's also at the core of the recently presented policy document on relations with the Caribbean and Latin America that we, the Central Action Service and the Commission presented to our member states. It's one of the four pillars of action shaping the future of our relations with your part of the world. The forces exercising pressure on our societies are strong, complex and diverse in nature. There's no magic formula to resist them, but building resilience is what we can, what can get closer to a solution. A very complex and difficult solution requiring investments and changes in behavior and in mentalities, fighting and adapting to climate change, giving a second chance to endangered ecosystems, combating inequalities and insecurity in our societies, and supporting the institutions of governments to implement it. In this context, I'm glad to announce that the European Union delivers its support according to promises and expectations. One and a half year after the post-hurricane pledging conference in New York, where we pledged 300 million euro for reconstruction and resilience building in this region, actions of almost 200 million are already being implemented in the field and the remaining 100 million is well advanced in the pipeline. Among the flagship programs we dedicated to resilience building and disaster risk reduction, I would like to mention in particular the natural disaster facility in Cary Forum, implemented by our strong, regions, uh, strong partners in the region, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, and the Caribbean Regional Resilience Building Facility, implemented by the World Bank. Both programs will officially kick off during this understanding risk Caribbean event. Alongside our strong cooperation and partnership on development, the EU and the Caribbean nations have recently, in Katowice in Poland last December, reaffirmed our steadfast commitment to the principles of the Paris Agreement as the essential multilateral framework governing global action to deal with climate change. It is a cornerstone of the rules-based international order, and the adoption in Katowice of the common rulebook gives us a reference framework by which we can hold all partners around the world to account for the action that they take or should take. 
The EU and the alliance of small island states are also long-term long -term allies in the fight against climate change. Action by all will be required to preserve the momentum towards the implementation of that rule book agreed at COP24 last December. It's now more important than ever that the EU, together with the Alliance of Small Island States, presently chaired by the Caribbean nation of Belize, takes the lead in driving that Paris implementation agenda further forward. And we look ahead to the next conference of the parties in Chile in December to see how, together, we can encourage others to follow the lead that you have taken and that we have taken with you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm aware that this would not reduce the risk that we are all facing on short and medium term, but I am convinced that strong and common climate action and resilience building action will give a chance to future generations here and elsewhere in the world not to have to face even more and disastrous, terrifying risks, not to have to ask themselves every October the questions by which I started this intervention. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being here. And I wish you all a very productive conference. Thank you. Good evening, you are Caribbean. How are you all doing? Tell me, how many people here know how many named weather systems impacted our region in 2017? 10, 12, 17. 17 named weather systems impacted our region in 2017. 10 hurricanes and six major hurricanes. That's right, so our beautiful tropical paradise is actually identified as one of the most vulnerable regions of the world. Over 2000 to 2017, the borrowing member countries of the Caribbean Development Bank suffered damage and losses in excess of US $27 billion. What does this look like in real terms? In 2004 and 2017, Grenada and Dominica respectively lost the equivalent of 200% of their gross domestic product. And Dominica also lost 90% of their GDP in 2015. So, what is CDB doing about this? Well, enshrined in our charter, is a mandate to reduce poverty. So we seek to promote inclusive and sustainable development in all of our board member countries. What this means is that if for no other reason we exist to make the lives of the people in this region better, we seek to improve their livelihoods and life chances, not just now, but for generations to come. So let's think about this. For this to be sustainable, we need to work collaboratively, not only with our board member countries, but with also with our regional and international stakeholders and partners, as can be seen here in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria in 2017 in Dominica. But let's be clear, any meaningful attempt at improving livelihoods or reducing poverty must take a hard, honest look at what it takes to build resilience in this region. At CDB, we have responded to this challenge by incorporating climate vulnerability assessments and climate risk screening in the preparation and design of all of our capital projects. This means that infrastructure funded by CDB will be better able to respond to climate impacts in the future. So I know you're spoiled for choice, and you're wondering which technical session you should go to. Well, in our session, we will treat with four aspects of resilience in this region. Community resilience, urban resilience, building standards, and early warning systems. For sustainability, for, for, for resilience to be sustainable, communities must see the linkage and appreci appreciate the linkage between their daily activities and the potential hazard uh, impacts of natural hazards. Under our Community Disaster Risk Reduction Fund, and our basic needs trust fund, we have developed an effective community enhancement engagement strategy. We've discovered new ways to enlist community participation, strengthen community engagement, and build community resilience, urban resilience. Did you know that 52% of the population of the Caribbean resides in urban centers? 66% of our region is actually considered urban, 
and 90% of our cities exist along coastal zones. So come and hear about our journey to promote livable, sustainable, safe, resilient, smart cities. We will be discussing this during our sessions. But we have a critical issue in the Caribbean right now. Our building codes are in urgent need of upgrading to incorporate climate change and the impacts of climate change and they need to be enforced consistently. Also, we need to incorporate, to simplify our codes, to facilitate the construction of safe and affordable houses for low income homeowners. We will grapple with these vexing issues in our sessions and provide viable solutions. But to support a better built environment, the importance of robust and responsive early warning systems cannot be overstated. Early warning, state, early warning systems help us prepare for the impending hazard impacts. And I would like to share with you in our session the success we've had in using grant resources to develop, to expand and update climate and weather uh, systems, and also to deliver and, and develop climate services to our region. So, on Wednesday, May the 29th, between 11.45 and 1 p.m., there really is no other place to be but the Goddard Room School of Business at the University of the West Indies. If you care about this region, and I know you do, I will see you there. I thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, as you can see from the title of this particular presentation, it's pretty exciting stuff. Strategic approaches to the design, operating, and sustainability of information and communications technology environments. Before you grab your bags and head to the pub, or go back on your WhatsApp, I'd like you to have a look at the statement here. The consequences resulting from unavailability of critical ICT environments during times of crisis could prove as catastrophic as the crisis event itself. Do you believe me? I have something that I call the oops moment. You know when you're working on a document late at night and you overwrite it by mistake and you save it and you go, oops, I shouldn't have done that, or words to that effect. Let's take a data center, and let's say it holds all the government IT environment in it, including computer-based early warning systems. Somebody outside is repairing the road, they cut through the only communications cable that's in there. Now the data center is separate from its environment. The disaster management system, send the sensors sending back information, can't communicate with the data center. Therefore, people don't get the information they require, and a natural disaster event occurs. We've had what we call a single point of failure in that environment. And the consequence of that is probably more catastrophic than the crisis event itself. And a single point of failure can occur anywhere. It can occur at the data center level, communications level. It can also occur at financial sustainability level. Why is this important for the Caribbean? Well, we've all heard a lot about um, smart society, smart economy, digital government, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, all of these different kinds of things that are coming in the Caribbean. They all have one common element. They require high availability ICT infrastructure. That means from a physical environment, from data centers to communication networks to power supplies, but also digital information security. As we move towards greater in use of ICT across the board, not just in disaster management, but also in day-to-day -day activities, if we don't have a strategic, port, uh, a strategic approach to ICT design, we're much more vulnerable to failure. So we need to understand the risk from ICT perspective. And it's not just about natural disaster and climate change, which of course this particular event is covering, but it's also about man-made catastrophe events like acts of terrorism, cybersecurity, or even just simple errors. Complex ICT environments can only be sustained through strategic, systematic approaches to design, implement, and sustain these environments. So where then does ITC fit into the organizational environment? It's not just with the IT department. You don't go to the IT department and go, fix that problem. It has to be changed. It now must be brought up to, at the national level, a national security 
um, and an economic policy level. We need to have a strategic approach to ensure that we can be resilient with the use of information and security technologies. We need to understand the risks and we need to prioritize the risks. And then we need to mitigate the risks. To do this, we will say in Cloud Carb, you must go for standards, international standards, both in the physical environment, using ISO, ITEL standards for physical infrastructure, but also we need to consider financial sustainability capital cost versus operational cost. And this is the kind of thing we will cover in our training session on Thursday afternoon at 1.30 p.m. We will cover infrastructure issues on a strategic level. We will also look at cyber security and the need, need for digital resilience in a, an increasingly digital world. We'll also address the need to establish disaster recovery and business continuity strategies, which are critical in ICT-enabled environments. And also, looking at operational sustainability, including financial sustainability. We will then look at a case study, which is the Bahamas Government Cloud Network. It's a highly resilient, state-of-the-art, multi-island network infrastructure, which Cloud Carb was one of the central bodies to help the government implement and continues today to manage this cloud environment. We believe that this approach and the lessons learned is something that we can extrapolate up to the entire region to provide a much greater ICT resilient environment to protect digital data. Now, this may sound a lot of technical stuff, but it's not designed for that. It's designed to be strategic. So we're not looking for just IT people. We're looking for permanent secretaries in various ministries. We're looking for CEOs from companies, heads of department, to look at the strategic, the strategic issues related to ICT sustainability. As I've said, Training session eight is on Thursday afternoon at 1.30 in the Pedagogical Center in Cave Hill. And I'm also giving a quick shout out to the panel session number 14 on physical resilience because Cloud Carb will be part of that panel, where we will also look at a project the World Bank is doing for um, um, infrastructure asset management in the Dominica. And we'll also have a look at how telecoms companies should be operating with national disaster agencies in times of crisis and how that can be improved. And of course, we'll be looking with Cloud Carob again in a bit more detail on the standards required to secure and promote uh, information technology. Now, I don't have any gimmicks to give you to come there, but there is a rumor that there might be some Barbadian rum. <laughs> that could be fake news, but the only way you're going to know is when you turn up to the session. Thank you very much. I am Elizabeth Emmanuel, and like climate change, Gina and I are changing today. For all of you here, you know both of us. It's either Liz, Gina, Gina, Liz, so it's Liz today. But the climate is changing. Like the world, the climate is changing, and we're seeing what is happening each and every day. When we think of the Caribbean, for example, we're seeing more severe events, more frequent events, but what is really worrying is that whilst mortality and morbidity is decreasing, the cost of these disasters are rising and they're impacting our country's ability, our policymakers' ability to, to get onto that path of sustainable prosperity, to do what is necessary for education, for health. So in a world of uncertainty, we know one thing is certain, these hazards will happen and we have to do something. So uncertainty for us is oftentimes reality. What do we do? Do we just do what we're doing now? Do we implement disaster risk management strategies? Is disaster risk financing the solution? What is the right equation to advance sustainable prosperity? 15 years ago, we had a watershed event in the Caribbean. I don't have a lot of time, but we all know what happened. Ivan happened 15 years ago. And our governments, instead of scratching their heads, they said, we have to find a solution. And they approached the bank for a disaster risk financing solution. A baby boy was born 12 years ago. Criff was born. He's the first, he's Caribbean, multi-country, risk pool, parametric. We hear all kinds of things when we say the word Criff. But guess what? It's misunderstood. We have all heard of it, and if you never did, you heard it this evening about four times. 
We need to demystify CRIF. It's misunderstood. But simply put, it's a disaster risk financing instrument. It's at the top of the, of the class. It's not first in the class, but it's the top. Because what it's looking at is those high layer risks. Those risks that happen infrequently, but cause significant impact. It's not the so-so rain, like Jamaicans say, right, Mr. Sweeney? It's not the rain that, it's about catastrophe events. But it's not that the whole country have to mash up for you to get a payout. Because guess what? We've had 38 payouts totaling $139 million. But is that what CRIF is about? Not really. We are about helping and supporting the people of this region. Our payouts have done some marvelous things. For example, post-event activities. When we think of countries like Haiti, we heard that today 20% of what was pledged did not reach. But guess what? CRIF's money got there within 14 days, 10 times their policy premium. We have a, a situation here. Last year, the Honorable Minister received a payout from CRIF. Our director was there presenting that payout. So the truth is, we're enhancing resilience to external vol volatility through financial innovation is important, it's critical, it's new way of thinking. Because in a world of certainty, anything can happen. And in this world of uncertainty, we need to include disaster risk financing as a priority in our fiscal policy framework. So join us, we're igniting, so we're having a fireside chat. So join us for our fireside chat on, the, on Wednesday morning. Why are we having a fireside chat? Because we wanna be a little different. So we want to interact with you in this chat. Hear from our disaster risk financing expert who left CRIF, went to Africa, and the Pacific and help to create two facilities. How can we learn from them? Here, for example, from our CEO, from the CDB, and from two countries, St. Lucia and, Domin and Dominica. We're on on the 29th, 10, 10 a.m., so be prompt, in the Goddard Room. But we also want to hear from you. So come chat with us, as we say in Jamaica, talk up the things, CRIF is closing the protection gap. Let us solve the CRIF mystery. It's yours, it's the Caribbean, it's a best practice. Join us. Thank you. This is an event that the CARICOM Secretariat considers very timely and necessary. The community in 2015 committed in its Regional Strategic Plan 2015 to 2019 to strategies that the region would pursue to build its economic, social, environmental, and technological resilience. Indeed, a resilience agenda is a developmental necessity for the Caribbean region, and the core themes of this conference explore some of the key factors in building resilience. It is a well-known fact that CARICOM countries contribute less than 1% to global greenhouse gas emissions. Yet when it comes to the impact of global climate change, we are among the most severely affected. Climate change with associated sea level rise is not only a threat to our environment and economic development, but to our very existence as small island states and low-lying coastal developing states. The Paris Agreement, to which all CARICOM member states are signatory, acted as a catalyst for the international community to strengthen its global response to the threat of climate change. And I think that this week's conference is part of that rollout of that commitment. The potential economic cost to this region in the face of increasing frequency and intensity of hydrometeorological events, not only limited to storms and hurricanes, but also to drought brought on by global climate change, has the potential to set back gains realized in economic and social development by decades. This has demanded that the issues associated with climate change and climate vari variability 
be addressed in the region's overarching development planning frameworks. According to the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, for example, for the period between 1990 and 2014, the Caribbean sustained losses of between 1.8 to 2% of gross domestic product per annum. And in many cases, losses have exceeded 100% of gross domestic project, product. For example, Ivan in Grenada in 2004, the Haitian earthquake in 2010, Irma and the effect, impact on the British Virgin Islands in 2017, Maria uh, and the impact in Dominica in 2017. And you would note that we also take into account seismic events just in case we forget that this region is also a seismically active area. And indeed, our research unit at the University of the West Indies has indicated that hundreds of earthquakes occur each year. We've been fortunate that most of them have not caused serious damage. The CARICOM region with a population of over 18 million people has very few countries which have escaped serious disaster related damage within the past two decades. And of course, approximately three quarters of our population live in at-risk areas and one third lives in areas highly exposed to hazards. Disasters affect the productive sectors of the economy, particularly agriculture and tourism, as well as critical infrastructure. And scarce resources earmarked for development programs and projects have to be diverted to relief and reconstruction following disasters. The inherent vulnerability is compounded by external economic factors. The region is facing declining overseas development assistance due to the graduation of many CARICOM states to middle income status, as well as declining levels of foreign direct investment. We are also faced with blacklisting, which threatens our financial services sectors, and de-risking, resulting in loss of correspondent banking, reduced remittance flows, increased cost of money transfers, and disruption of trade flows. The combined economic and environmental vulnerabilities mean that there is very little room for error in our region. And it is for these reasons that the Secretariat considers this conference very timely. Over the next few days, I'm sure you will discuss some of the interventions being taken at the national level to address risk or improving our understanding of risk. And as a CARICOM grouping, there are several initiatives being undertaken by our regional institutions which have a bearing on the issues being discussed in this conference. For example, the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology has been collaborating with its network of national meteorological and hydrological services and a consortium of coordination sectoral partners on an early warning information system across climate time scales. This partnership has been working together to increase the range of sector-specific climate products and tools that support evidence-based and risk-informed decisions in key economic and social sectors. The concept is a new and innovative and is being examined by the international community as a global best practice to be replicated in other regions. Another example, the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, segregated portfolio company, has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism to finalize its fisheries and aquaculture parametric insurance product for the region. And the goal is to develop a climate resilient fisheries and aquacultural industry in the region with parametric insurance to insulate from <coughs> climate change related damages. And the Caribbean Agricultural Research and Development Institute will be promoting the adoption of climate smart agricultural practices by pursuing effective partnerships, capacity building opportunities, and information information generation dissemination. And last, but by no means least, there is the ongoing work of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Agency 
Sedema, one of the co-organizers of this conference, which spearheaded the adoption at the regional level of a strategic comprehensive disaster management framework. And the goal of this framework is to realize safer, more resilient, sustainable Sedema participating states through comprehensive disaster management. I have no doubt that over the next few days you will learn a great deal about the excellent work being done by Sedema on behalf of the region. In closing, let me wish you very successful deliberations. We hope that we can build on the foundation of ongoing work in the region, look at new and emerging methodologies, uh, and put forward practical recommendations for the attention of regional decision makers. I wish to thank the organizers, uh, SEDEMA, the World Bank, the European Union, for the excellent program, and of course, the government of Barbados for its very generous hospitality. The CARICOM Secretariat remains ready and willing to cooperate and collaborate with all partners to advance the sustainable development of our region. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Our session's on Tuesday, tomorrow at 11.40 a.m. We'd like to invite you to our session because you're going to be hearing real stories from real people that live and breathe and have experienced disaster here in the Caribbean. We all live on islands, but our islands are of a different size, different populations, different cultures. We speak different languages. But what are those lessons learned? What are those best practices that we can take and share between islands for communicating from the government up here down to the population and back the other way? But we have a problem. And we have a problem when we think too big. And when planes land on our island, we understand from a risk perspective that we've got everything under control. And we believe that we've mitigated the risks. But we also have a problem when we think too small when these ships that have 10 times the number on a plane arrive each day, but they only stay a few hours, therefore the risk is not big enough. But we also have another problem when we use the wrong tools. When a mosquito spreads dengue, chikungunya or Zika and the World Health Organization gets out their coloring pencils and colors in the country, what sort of risk does that give us or give the people? Or when we look at points of entry, whether people get off the ships or they get off the planes and we put posters up that says, if you've been to a Zika affected country. No, I didn't go to a Zika affected country. I went to Barbados. Or when the US government looks at risk and says, in Miami, we need to get our coloring and pencils out and color in the neighborhood red. From our mental model, what does red mean to us? Danger. It's a no go, it's stop. Or when the media, the journalists go, we can do better than just colouring neighbourhoods. We can look at how to understand risk by getting free satellite imagery from Google Earth and saying, you live in this house, you live in that house, what's it like to live in the danger zone? And we wonder when people ask us, why are people scared? Why are they afraid? What was the miscommunication? What can we do better? What did we not do? And that's what we all need to address this week. I come from a small country town. We started teaching risk and mitigation at schools. Every child learnt this is the level of the 1954 flood. So when the next flood came, we could say it's going to be lower than 1954 or higher than 1954. One message. But in 2017, the rain came, so, came down so hard and the storm surge was so big that sharks for the very first time appeared in our streets. And the message went out from the government, there are sharks in our street, and the people came down to take selfies with those sharks. My panel is going to talk to you through a, their experiences, their personal experiences of Irma, but they relate to other natural hazards, earthquakes, tsunamis, uh, and, and, other, and other, other hazards that we deal with here in the Caribbean. We're also going to talk about how to identify vulnerable populations. What are our plans for moving diabetics, infants, or people that rely on electricity? How do we move them? Who do we move them with? What are those organizations that have to come to the table, not just during the disaster to build relationships, but before the disaster happens to build those necessary partnerships so that we understand and mitigate all the risks for the hazards that we face? But what do we do if we're relying on technology, if we're relying on electricity and it goes out? What other visual ways can we communicate? 
If we start a fire, black smoke means stay in your house or go to a shelter. Does that work? How do we look at our understanding of where the location of critical assets are? On the map on the left and the map on the right was built in five days, but not before the disaster, during the disaster. How do we do better than that? How do we look at tools and use tools, the right tools such as what three words, which divided the globe up into 57 trillion, three meter, three meter by three meter squares and gave them a three word address. So that there are other similar tools like this so that when we do search and rescue, when we have to pick up people in the boat, what address does this boat have? Do we use a GPS, latitude, longitude, or do we use a three word address? What works on your island? What have you tried? We wanna hear from you. So I wanna introduce you to my panel. Joy, Fenner, Mahe, Priya, Bess, uh, Jess, Stuyvesant and Lewis, all real people, all people that have, have experienced real disaster, they're going to speak from the heart, they're going to speak about their approaches, their methods, they're going to pre they talk about what worked, what didn't work, and then they're going to open up to the audience and they want to hear your ideas. They want to hear what you do so that we can approve, uh, improve as a community to share communication lessons learned between the islands. Look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. Thank you. So on Friday morning, my colleagues from the Caribbean Center for Disaster Medicine at the American University for the Caribbean on the island of St. Martin will have the pleasure of giving you a unique experience, a unique experience of participating in a simulation game called Friday Night at the ER. This game was developed over 30 years ago and you're going to have that opportunity to participate in this game. It focuses on systems thinking, complex problem solving. It's where you will run an emergency uh, uh, department in a hospital for 24 hours. You'll participate in a board game called Friday Night at the Emergency Room, four people at the table. One will do critical care, surgery, emergency, and the other person will do step down where patients are moved out into other wards of the hospital. You'll manage the hospital operations. You'll keep costs down and ensuring that quality is high. Throughout this game, you'll learn to collaborate across boundaries. You'll learn to use innovation. You'll learn to use complex problem solving techniques. I also want to emphasize that Sometimes when we have written plans on a, on a paper document, sometimes when we have meetings, we don't work, we work as a group, not as a team. How in this picture do we identify the hazards then do our risk assessment? How do we all sitting in the boat help to mitigate those risks? When you play this game, you'll need to start thinking, do I save millions at a time or do I focus and save one person at a time? How do we work together? How do we work as individuals? How do we make decisions? How does the situation become dynamic and change throughout the game? And yes, this game, this simulation game has been used here in the Caribbean. And with the feedback that we've had after the game, we have a debrief session and most of the, the, the people that have participated in this game said, we want to play it again. But as we identify what question, it's not going to be the question, are you my mother? It's going to be other questions. What are the questions that we need to identify the data that we need, how to analyze and use that data, and how do we use the data to make decisions? Who can play this game? Yes, it's situated in a hospital, but you need no medical background to play the game. The game has been used in 35 countries, in 14 languages, by over a thousand organizations. What does it cost you to play the game on Friday? Nothing. We're bringing the game to the UR Caribbean Conference. You'll pay nothing to play this game. We'll be playing for three and a half hours. We'll play the game twice. But why play a game? Because the publications, the conferences, the presentations in the last 30 years have all been evidence-based. The surveys have used a like at scale this one and have shown that by playing a simulation game like Friday night at the ER, it has helped teams to develop and do better functions, but also helped to do complex problem solving and to introduce the principles of systems thinking. So it's evidence-based, and I'll be more than happy to share those publications with you. But it's not the only game out there. The climate folks have been doing this for years. The World Climate Simulation is a game that focuses on policy and awareness of climate change. On the bottom is a game that's been around for 60 years called the Beer Management Game, which teaches business 
our students the fundamentals of supply chain management and how their decisions can cause critical changes in the supply of what? Beer. And so as we take these principles of systems thinking, the principles of complex problem solving, collaborating across boundaries, we look at your job description of you sitting here tonight, when you go back to your jobs, within, within your job description, where does it actually state that you need to collaborate? Where does it actually need to focus, that you need to focus on systems thinking? Where does it say, or it creates an enabling environment in your job description to solve complex problems? Simulation games like this will help you develop those skills. So once again, it's free, it's for everyone. Come and join us Friday, 9 a.m. for a game, a simulation that you will remember forever. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Prime Minister St. Martin, distinguished delegates all. The Chairman forgot to tell you that on that Saturday morning, they gave me a cup, and the cup had inscribed on it simply, this generation shall change the world. I understood then, on that Saturday morning, that this was a journey. It was not a single event or a single destination. And if I ever doubted it, knowing where we stand today as a country, and knowing where the world stands, confronting some of the challenges that more than ever will come to determine what aspects of our civilization survive, I know it is a journey. But it is a journey for us in the region that too often leaves us invisible. And in our view, sometimes we feel that others believe that we are dispensable. It is a journey that causes us to ask the question, how many people will keep us front of mind after a video as you have just seen? Or does it evoke the emotions of the moment then to surrender once again to the politics of the day and to the bureaucracy of the day? We in the Caribbean have had to face difficulties and risk for our almost entire postmodern settlement of these islands. Some may argue that those who are the original inhabitants of this region equally faced similar challenges and were themselves decimated from their places of abode. This is not an easy thing for a people or for a nation state to confront. I've given too many speeches. We've said the same thing over and over and over. And we understand that the move from risk to resilience requires the acceptance of responsibility on the part of many. First and foremost, for us who inhabit these lands. For us who must change our practices and our laws to reflect a greater level of resilience from that which we inherited and accepted as par for the course and acceptable for the times in which we lived. Those people in Barbados, for example, who in the post-Hurricane Janet environment believe that it was acceptable to receive the work and the direction of what came to be known as storm carpenters because of a shortage of carpenters who were capable of being available to restore the housing that was so devastated after Hurricane Janet. We came to accept that it was okay for them to build what we have termed flat roof houses, removing from our landscape centuries of architecture that understood that to resist the winds from which we are vulnerable, that we required gable roofs and hip roofs in order to withstand it with minimal overhang, just as you see here on this ancient building 
in the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the hip roof. But what was to have been a temporary fix came from government buildings to chattel houses as you look around you, came to be regarded as a permanent feature of our modern landscape. The ability to acknowledge and to correct these practices is part and parcel of the changes in our behavior that are required of us if we are literally to prepare ourselves for a new world in which our vulnerability has considerably risen from that which it was for the last few decades. It requires that we have a different relationship with that most vital of commodities called water. And in fact, I have asked the Minister of Water who is here with us to bring to Cabinet only this week a plan to prepare the country for the level of conservation that is critically needed as we now find ourselves clearly in the midst of a drought in this year of our Lord. These are the things that require changes in behavior, but some of them have a cost. And to the extent that they have a cost, the society and the government has to determine how best it can work together to finance those things that are essential to our existence and not optional to our lives. And what do I mean? In almost every single Caribbean country, the basic and critical water infrastructure was laid more than a century ago, invariably by countries that were responsible for our colonization and whose resources depended not simply on the taxation of a limited sized population on each individual country. We find ourselves today confronted with the absolute reality of having to replace infrastructure at a cost that is highly prohibitive and over the course of the next two to three decades and have to be able to do so in a way that can sustain the viability first of our states because without water we have nothing. We have been told, for example, in our own country that with the 2,500 kilometers of pipe that we have, the majority of which has to be replaced at a price that we are fighting coming close to a million dollars per kilometer, that it would be a mammoth task of virtually 25% of our GDP to simply seek to replace the water infrastructure without reference to what we must invest in augmentation of water resources as we confront the reality of being a water scarce country in this world. This has nothing at all to do with our ability to meander through and to navigate through our otherwise difficult and perilous economic circumstances. I raise this issue because it requires of us, and Barbados is just but an example of what is necessary in the rest of the region. And perhaps the conversation is best regional and not domestic. It requires of us a conversation with our people to begin to understand how best one, we may conserve the precious resource, given that we are more likely to face the droughts, and you have heard from all of the previous speakers before me, all of the evidentiary basis for why I speak in the tone in which I speak. But we must first confront how we are going to deal with it. It is easy for us to say, let's run some public service announcements. But public service announcements in and of themselves will not be sufficient. And the change in behavior has, in my view, first to be led by the children of this nation and by their parents and by the communities, recognizing that the cost of water will continue to rise if the level of water that is wasted in terms of non-revenue water continues to be on the increase as we have seen in the last few decades. I go further. We have to make a determination as to how best we put aside that money that is necessary to be able to stabilize our capital infrastructure program by first securing of our own 
a sinking fund that is dedicated purely to capital replacement over the course of the next few decades. It is going to be impossible for the people of this nation to replace 2,500 kilometers of infrastructure, the water pipe, water mains, within a 10-year period or even a 20-year period. And we have, therefore, to look at a 25 to 30-year horizon that we simply put aside that which is necessary in order to be able to I smell fire, smoke. Somebody check, please. It is critical that we put aside those funds. But the lumpy nature of the investment is such that we have, in my view, to make serious decisions as a nation, first and foremost, to protect the fund by embedding it in our constitution. And I say so from the perspective that 30 years ago, a similar capital fund was simply disbanded without reference to the needs of the future. But secondly, we may have within the limited capacity of what you can earn within a small economy such as this to protect and to preserve areas that will guarantee a level of revenue in order to be able to ensure that we can replace the critical infrastructure when needed. And to what do I refer? Everybody is interested in renewable energy. But renewable energy represents more than anything else the patrimony of the particular region. And if we, therefore, are to ensure and guarantee our own survival, it is my humble view that we may need to, particularly where we have public water infrastructure firms, to, pre to preserve a portion of the market for our water authorities to work in order to be able to help fund that sinking fund that is dedicated to capital infrastructure so that there is no but or ifs as to how we can meet the targets with respect to the replacement of the mains as we go forward. And why do I say so? Having dealt with getting our own situation right, having dealt with looking in the mirror and determining what we must do and how we must change, whether in terms of our individual practices or collective practices or legislative framework, as we've tried to do in the past, and I believe that the head of Sedema knows it firsthand, because you could only call on the Jamaica Defense Force to come into Dominica to supplement the Dominican and RSS forces because of that treaty that we negotiated and passed in 2006 in Barbados that many did not use until such time. But it is critical that we now engage those who have placed us on the front line of this battle. Ambassador Matherin made it clear that the percentage of contribution of this region to global greenhouse gases is as negligible as our capacity to distort global trade in goods and services. I use that deliberately as the reference point because for more than 25 years, this little region has tried to advance a simple argument for the special and differential treatment with respect to our international trade obligations that has been largely unsuccessful because we have been invisible and disposable for most persons. Is there a difficulty? Is there a difficulty? Next door. Okay, thanks. If there is, I'm sure that I will guarantee that you get out before me. <laughs> but the bottom line is that for more than 25 years, we have literally tried to sustain an argument against a one-size-fits-all prescription and that recognizes that the inability to distort global trade in goods and services ought to matter 
because there is a disproportionate consequence to enterprises within our region who in many instances were forced either to shut down production or to become marginalized because of the removal of non-tariff barriers and the reduction of tariffs as a result of our becoming signatory to the WTO and participating in a global trading bloc that, that, that was intended to bring sustainable development and progress to people. If <laughs> we were unsuccessful then, for those decades, it causes me to wonder how successful we shall be now with respect to the acknowledgement by the rest of the world that these countries remain on the front line of a war that we did not start, nor do we sustain. And that if those images and voices that you just heard are to mean something, then it has to go beyond simply the tear or the acknowledgement of its power and to recognize that when you return to your individual capitals or to your individual organizations, the continued belief that countries can be graduated on the basis of middle income status purely on GDP and precluded from access to critical funding to be able to modernize their infrastructure. in the face of inherent vulnerability, has really to become a historic topic rather than a fight that we are continuing to wage on a daily basis. I'm not even going in at this stage to the extent to which politics has been allowed, global politics and power relations has been allowed to literally creep in to the determination as to who can benefit and who shall not benefit. And, and I fully accept, fully accept that the efforts are not simply at the level, or let me put it another way, that the battle is being waged not at the level of the technocrats or the management of international organizations, but is being waged regrettably at the level of capitals. This is unsustainable. And we have to determine that if we really want to be able to make progress against the battles that cause tremendous risk such that we can become resilient, then we need to start doing things differently and we need to start recognizing first and foremost that failure to act Failure to act is largely because you do not believe that the problem is important enough to guarantee such action or to require such action. That's the hardest thing for us as Caribbean people to accept. And it's hard because the world is committed to acting beyond a three degree change. It fights on a two degree change and it doesn't acknowledge that we need 1.5 to survive. Now you ask yourself, on what basis can there be a sustainable platform for international cooperation and development if the very right to life and the very right to the sustainable nature to sustaining our societies is not accepted as a prerequisite for action. I hope that your gathering here in this, our country, will help continue the process of being able to change minds and hearts and not to build the action because the foundation for action isn't with us. We understand what it is to have climate refugees. You saw Yvonne. She lives in Barbados, not Montserrat. You saw the people who had to leave Barbuda or the people who have not returned to Dominica. The notion of climate refugees is well known to us here in the region. But then again, we're not buttressed by the comfort that migration is a major topic of importance for the world. Because when it comes to people, 
it becomes a no-no. But when it comes to the movement of capital and investment, it becomes highly accepted and desired by the majority of countries in the world. There is need for a moral and ethical discussion across the global landscape. And it is our contention that it is only when moral and ethical leadership is given, both at the national level and at the international level, that we will summon the courage to fight down these battles. Until such time, it is a form of idle entertainment for those who choose to watch. And I say so, not intending to shock, nor not intending to be rude, but I say so conscious that with every hurricane, the place of choice for those who don't go to shelters is a bathroom. I say so conscious that for every meeting I make in September or October, I know that there is a risk or a likelihood of cancellation because we do not know what could befall us within 72 hours. I say so conscious that irrespective of whatever else you have to say about Haiti, it has not received 20% of the pledges pledged to it in the earthquake, post-earthquake environment. I say so conscious that it is too easy to forget these images and too hard to stand up for what is right. I pray that those of you who gather here first will help us as policymakers understand the art of the possible. For you, as technicians more than anything else, will frame what is technically possible, whether at the level of infrastructure, science and technology, capacity to finance, or general policy making. But I also am conscious that the simple exercise of you determining what is possible will mean nothing unless buttressed by two levels of political will. Domestic political will and international political will without which we will just become a footnote in the history of mankind. Thank you and God bless. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. So when we think of your home, what does it mean to you? For most people, your home is where you live. It's your sanctuary. It's where you build your memories with your family, with your friends, and it's a form of wealth. It's one of the biggest assets and the biggest forms of intergenerational wealth, where parents leave their homes for their children and for their grandchildren. So with one storm that wipes out the housing stock, families' wealth go away with the wind. And we know that in recent disasters, over 60% of housing stock was damaged in our countries. And so the impact is high, and the impact on the family is high. So I ask you, what are some of the reasons you think our housing stock is so vulnerable? Construction, right, regulations, right? There's so many different reasons. There's limited land, and there's also high costs, lack of affordability, right? This is partly because of construction, but also because of the market, and our countries are aware of this, and we're doing something about it. So in this session, we will hear from St. Martin about a housing assessment that they did to better understand their housing market and how that impacts their vulnerability and resilience. We will hear from St. Vincent and the Grenadines and their housing development corporation to hear what are they doing to help the poor the vulnerable, the disabled, and to put them into safe and secure homes. We will hear from Dominica. What are they doing to build back after Hurricane Maria? What is their reconstruction plan? And how do they make their homes more, uh, sorry, <laughs> how do they make their homes more safe and secure? And we will also hear about the Climate Adaptation Financing Facility, which is funded from the Climate Investment Funds. 
It's a pilot program that helps households to climate proof their homes before an event. These innovations are actually happening in our countries right now, and government representatives will talk about these in the session on Tuesday at 11.40 a.m., and I hope you can join us and participate in the discussion. Now, for most of us here, surprisingly, when you talk about cities in the Caribbean or urban areas in the Caribbean, people ask you, what are you talking about? Because when they think of the Caribbean, they think of the aquamarine beaches and where they go on vacation. But they don't think of the Caribbean as having cities and having city spaces. But as Mr. Best said, over 60% of our populations live in urban areas. So we do have much of our city communities living in cities. And we have to think about how do we address that? Because our cities face the same challenges as other cities all around the world. Plus, we have the size issue, and we have all these other congestion issues that we have to deal with. So how are we thinking about our cities? Statistics have shown that there's urban population growth. They expect that by 2050, the total land area will be double to quadruple the size that it is now. Of course, there's also development along our coastlines, which means that now we have a unique window of opportunity. Let's think about it. Our cities, when was that infrastructure built? And if we're thinking about expanding what we build now, how long would that last? So we have the opportunity to build now and to build well. We will have in the panel hear about global experiences. We'll also hear about specific activities that's happening in St. Lucia, where they're doing a cash-use redevelopment program. Come and hear what they're thinking about. It's very much in the early stage. In St. Vincent, they recently opened a new airport, and at the site of an old, the old airport, they want to build a modern city. What does it mean to have a modern city in the Caribbean setting? We're going to talk about that, as well as the revitalization of the capital city. And in St. George's Grenada, they're going to talk about their Climate Smart City Initiative, where they've partnered with New York University in order to build and develop a Climate Smart City. And since we're talking about climate smart and technology, we're going to bring Facebook into the conversation. Let's hear about how Facebook's social good program can help inform these initiatives in our countries. And the idea of this is that it's going to be an open discussion. We will have ideas presented from our um, country participants, but then we want to hear from you. What do you think? What would you like to see in your cities? How can you help inform them as they take on these initiatives? Thank you very much, and I hope to see you there. Dates and times are shown. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me here tonight. Um, I'm also a first timer on the Ignite stage, so I'll try to make this as exciting as possible. I am not an astronaut, <laughs> but I do talk about it quite often. Um, today, though, I'm gonna talk more about what I do with NASA and the Earth Sciences Division. Um, specifically, I'm tasked, along with many others, to ask how we can take science from space and turn it into something that's actually meaningful to all of you not just meaningful, but usable, relevant, and understandable for decisions. I am not an astronaut, but I'm also not a data scientist. I am a social scientist and a humanitarian. And so one of my central preoccupations while working with NASA has been on the question of what vulnerability looks like and how we can see vulnerability from using Earth observation data. Often we use it for hazards or for exposure, but the human element of disasters is vulnerability. And so when you start thinking about what it means to be vulnerable, to me, I ask, are we inherently vulnerable? Are we somehow incapable of making decisions? Are we deficient or lacking capacity? In my mind, that answer is absolutely not. We are instead a product of the multiple and complex situations that occur around us. And because of that, I transition my question from what does vulnerability look like and are we vulnerable to what creates vulnerability. This means that we have to look at changing environmental systems, changing economic and social systems, and also physical and governance or political systems. 
whether we're building in areas that are inherently at risk, in floodplains, along coastlines, using materials, as have previously been discussed, that are not appropriate or necessarily good for particular types of disaster, or whether we're not protecting our resources. We know that mangroves can buffer storm surge or that trees and vegetation can protect us from erosion and landslides. We also have to look at vulnerability through isolation and access, access to insurance or remoteness, being so far removed from your local community that you cannot access basic services. And finally, whether or not we're living in situations where the governance systems are not serving the people, extractive resources that are serving others outside but not the people in the community. So how do we take these situations and turn them into earth observation data or ways and methods of seeing vulnerability? It's not linear. <laughs> it doesn't take from one direction to the next. I think it's where social science and a diverse background of others come into play here. On one element, from a very basic standpoint, we can see geophysical change. We can see rivers swell and flood and impact communities. But what we're really concerned about is which houses are being impacted. And when the next storm comes, whether or not those houses will be worse off or better off because we've transitioned or changed the way we do business um, or if we do business as usual. We can run models based on past events that allow us to determine what a next storm or hurricane might look like, not only based on the past event, but what it could look like if it were worse changing the way we evacuate um, certain communities, changing the way that we send emergency responders, and also understanding the infrastructure, such as telecommunications and electricity. We very well know the path of a lot of hazards, whether the lava is flowing in a particular direction or if a hurricane is coming to you. But what we are getting better at by taking a focus on vulnerability is telling you when the lights are on, when the lights are off, and for how long they've remained off after a disaster. This is a proxy for vulnerability. These are people that are living remotely without access to their basic needs. But we've just gone through now what vulnerability looks like, how EO can be used or earth observations can be used, but do we know how to actually reduce it? I cannot answer this alone, Earth Observations cannot, but what I ask is for all of you to join my colleagues with me on Wednesday from 2.30 to 3.45, where we take an interactive and interdisciplinary approach to looking at vulnerability and how to reduce it before the disaster happens. I look forward to seeing all of you there, and thank you very much. Okay. Hi everybody, I would like to start off my presentation by asking you guys a question. When you guys see the coastal protection, these words, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Any takers? Yeah? Infrastructure? Okay, okay, well, um, it's safe to say that <laughs> many of you probably thought of something like this, and this very much reflects the common approach to uh, protecting our coast, which is using great infrastructure such as seawalls. However, I think we've become a bit too comfortable with these interventions. We know that they work, and we use them time and time again. They also provide a very visible face for an investment project. However, I think we can do more. I think we could do more to improve the lives of the communities that we serve. We need solutions that not only protect our coasts and assets, but also address other development challenges. For instance, we have climate. We only have 11 years to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. Or biodiversity, one million species are on the brink of extinction. And poverty, nearly half of the world still struggles to meet their basic needs. We need solutions that have their roots in the past, quite literally, but are uniquely positioned to be the next generation solutions. I'm talking about nature-based solutions, or NBS. MBS uses ecosystem elements as part of structural interventions. Green infrastructure, for instance, utilizes mangroves and corals and the like, while a hybrid approach integrates green into the gray. 
Now, MBS provides multiple opportunities. For instance, it can reduce risk, but do so at a lower cost. It can empower communities while also enhancing livelihoods, while also protecting or restoring the environment. So how does this look like in practice? Well, I'll give you an example of a mock MBS project that uses both mangroves and sea dikes to achieve disaster risk management goals, while also um, providing these multiple benefits. So meet Rihanna. Her and her coastal community were able to plant some mangroves alongside the sea dike. This was part of a hybrid infrastructure project that sought to engage the community in DRM activities. The mangroves alone resulted in a decrease of, uh, of a 36% decrease in wave height and the communities feel safer now. Mangroves also limited the, the need for an extensive sea dike, reducing costs. Rihanna was also able to work maintaining the mangroves, resulting in an increase in income. She also um, started an aquaculture collective, um, which farmed clams alongside the, the, the mangroves. Um, mangroves also resulted in um, providing nursery habitat for commercially important fish. This resulted in increase in biodiversity, enhanced fisheries, and also reduced CO2 emissions through carbon sequestration. The World Bank and GFDRR are working to bring stories like this to life through the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative. Our mainstream is to, I mean, our goal is to mainstream the use of nature-based solutions and DRM. So will you guys join us? We wanna recruit you guys, the DRM community, to join in our effort, efforts. By helping you guys champion MBS, you can help us scale up the, the use of these next generation solutions. This is why we've organized a hands-on session on Coastal MBS. Our session has two aims. The first is to familiarize participants with the use of MBS. This is why we've brought Juliana and Cindy, who have expertise in MBS and building community resilience, along with Dr. Tundi, from Baird Engineering. She would sh share her experience implementing hybrid infrastructure here in Barbados. Our second aim is to initiate conversations on possible MBS investments. As such, we will guide groups through a decision-making activity where in the end, groups will propose a mock MBS proposal. So come and work, 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 work with us um, <laughs> tomorrow at 10.15 a.m. We look forward to seeing you guys. Thank you. I know what you're thinking. Every time someone uses words like contingency finance, debt swaps, or cat TDOs, your eyes probably start to glaze over and you start to picture a cat named DDO. If that's true, I'm with you. Yes, when I say this session is about how countries use information to protect their budgets from macro fiscal shocks of disasters, it doesn't sound very sexy. I bet half of you are already asleep, like my friend, Miss Cat Didio. Simply put, this session is all about financial planning. What if I said the way countries make these decisions is in no way different from the way that you make your own financial planning decisions? Think about it. We have so many competing priorities. How should I budget for rent? How should I budget for health? How should I budget for vacations? And how do I select what I want for each of these things? Let's take an example. What if I wanted to budget some resources for a beach holiday? Should I go halfway across the globe to Bora Bora? Or should I settle for Ocean Beach, which is a 45 minute drive from where I live? Ultimately, the way that we make these decisions is based on one, how much information we have available to assess our different options, two, what can we actually afford, and three, what gives us the best bang for every buck? Let's unpack this a bit more. What are things you consider while opting into a health insurance plan? A, do I know what I'm prone to or likely to suffer from? B, what are these things gonna cost if they actually happen to me? C, what are some of those large out-of-pocket expenditures that I absolutely don't want to pay for? And D, what are those smaller things, like the common cold that I get every now and then that I could probably plan for and pay for myself? 
Policymakers ask very similar questions while making their own financial planning decisions. What are some of those large events th that impose high out-of-budget expenditures that they absolutely would like insurance-like instruments to cover? And what are those other smaller events, those common cold-like events, say local floods, that happen maybe once or twice a year that they could pl probably plan for and pay for themselves? The difference, of course, is countries don't have the same tools you do to make these decisions. Countries don't have a kayak that gives you the information you need about your beach holiday. And countries don't have an annual health checkup that gives you the information you need to structure your health financing plan. Countries rarely have enough information or accurate information to make these decisions. However, a lot has changed over the past decade, and Caribbean countries have played a leading role in that evolution. This is what this session will focus on. How are countries using the information available from public and private actors to select their own financial solutions? And what are some of the gaps that still remain? We'll hear from Dominica, who is still reeling from the impacts of Hurricane Maria, about what are their information needs to expand their financial toolkit. And when I say information, I don't mean the gibberish that's on this slide. And our session will talk about that as well. We'll also hear from St. Lucia, who's been working on data mapping for several years. And we'll hear from them about how this is going to inform their in risk models and then their financial solutions. We'll also hear from other stakeholders. We'll hear from the private sector about what are some of their cutting edge tools and analytics that Caribbean countries can leverage. And we'll hear from development partners about how they're working in these countries to help them overcome implementation barriers to financial solutions. In true UR style, we will create some disruption. We will play musical chairs with our panelists who will have to step into one another's shoes and answer some pretty difficult questions. With that, I'd like to invite you all to our session on May 28th at 10.15 a.m. You'll have a chance to hear from our panelists from St. Lucia, Dominica, DFID, Swiss Re, and also from our, um, our chairs from the World Bank. It's going to be great. It's going to be just like a music concert, except one where you might actually have a chance to sing and play with the stars of the show. And if you're lucky, they might even invite you to our after party. For those of you cat lovers in the audience, I'm going to leave you with one final treat to entice you to our event. And those of you allergic to cats, be rest assured, Miss Cat DDO will not make an appearance at our event. Let me first say uh, how uh, energizing and uh, enlightening it has been, Prime Minister, to engage with you during the last year or so, when you first uh, engaged with the World Bank uh, to bring in your uh, strategy and your vision and request for support. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that we have been able to, from the World Bank side, World Bank Group side, uh, bring in uh, uh, support to you uh, more, at least from my institution, on technical and advisory. Uh, I apologize that we have not been able to rise up to your request from the financing side, but uh, trust me, uh, you will find our other support, I hope, valuable. So I do want to say that right here. Uh, the um, Honorable Representative from the EU, uh, Mr. Leffer, and yourself, Ambassador, have actually made my task quite easy because you have covered a lot of substantive areas linked to resilience um, and understanding risk as well as climatic issues. Um, I do want to take this opportunity to share with you uh, a bit of uh, the broader uh, World Bank, uh, in a way, strategic direction for the uh, Caribbean. The first point I wanted to share is that uh, our engagement in the, uh, in the Caribbean is uh, extremely uh, strategic from the point of view of helping the uh, 20 countries or so that we are involved with, uh, from various, from financing to technical support, because of the actual extremity of, I think you mentioned the weather events and the needs, but also the needs of uh, the uh, Caribbean population for uh, elevating uh, the, uh, the competitiveness of the region in this globalized world, and, and that is connected to resilience across 
a range of areas, resilience that helps in uh, reducing risks, a better preparedness, resilience that uh, enables the, the fiscal and the financial side of it that, Prime Minister, you're dealing with right now, a resilience that also addresses human capital uh, and the lives of human beings, not just after a hurricane hits, but uh, ex ante, to, uh, to raise the quality of learning and the, co and the quality of health and overall the well-being of the population. Resilience in the context of the immense natural resource that this region possesses, which is quite unsurpassed, and that is your beautiful oceanic resources that help, can, over time, uh, help and contribute to A, diversification of the economy, B, uh, creating more jobs, and C, enhancing more tourism. And I refer to the blue economy, the ocean resources. I think June 8th is the Oceans Day, the World Oceans Day. And it's really uh, impressive that 14 of uh, Caribbean countries today have actually, uh, I believe, banned uh, single-use plastic plus and or styrofoam. The issue is implementing that ban and, and the issue is doing a lot more together. So, um, and resilience also finally is really the topic that we are here for is, uh, is uh, understanding risks and building back better. Uh, for all these reasons, uh, the World Bank Group is very proud to be partnering. We are proud to support multilateralism as mentioned by um, the EU delegate and really proud to be recipient of uh, administering trust, uh, grant resources on behalf of the European Union, uh, uh, the UK government, and also I want to mention here the Netherlands, uh, because uh, the team from St. Martin is here, we are administering a trust fund portfolio of over half a billion dollars, a Prime Minister, it's $550 million for building resilience across these dimensions. Today, uh, globally, uh, the World Bank's uh, direct assistance to uh, uh, I don't know if the word is disaster risk management. I'm looking at our technical expert, Mr. Zhang, sitting right there, or its resilience building is uh, about close to $6 billion US, uh, which is about over 10% of the World Bank's global portfolio. In the Caribbean, uh, the World Bank is uh, supporting uh, for the, uh, I would say, about 10 active uh, borrowing countries a portfolio of over $2 billion, out of which half, close to half, is directly in support of disaster risk management. So I, I wanted to underscore that uh, it's a huge, huge priority for, uh, uh, for the World Bank, and this is the reason uh, activities like this are extremely important, because not only it provides an opportunity to bring the uh, technical experts together, but also uh, for self-learning, but also the opportunity to raise uh, the political support for these issues. That is fundamentally extremely important. From uh, the World Bank side, uh, I quoted you some uh, numbers of uh, what uh, the support we are giving to this agenda globally. Is this enough, I, we ask ourselves? Clearly, this is not enough. Uh, we need to do, we as uh, your uh, representative, uh, because each member country is, owns the World Bank, uh, we need to do a lot more. We need to leverage a lot more. The international community needs to do a lot more because uh, all of it goes together to help not only uh, improve people's lives today, but also to protect their lives for future uh, events or future issues. And hence, the combination of financing and knowledge support is something that we believe uh, we need to all collectively work together in partnership. Uh, I do want to also use this opportunity to, uh, to highlight that uh, the events such as these are necessary and important uh, because they uh, spread uh, in today's world of social media and knowledge going all across very quickly, they spread the information and knowledge. Today, if the Prime Minister will tweet, I don't know if you tweet Prime Minister or not, but maybe if uh, I will tweet or somebody, you will tweet Prime Minister about this event, someone sitting far away in, uh, in a country I worked on, which is highly, highly prone to natural disasters, Nepal, thousands of miles away, will be saying, oh, this resonates with me. 
what are they doing? Let me see what's happening. So it's the learning that, that is uh, far beyond the 500 people who are gathered in this island uh, today um, and, and over the course of the week. The learning would extend you know, across the entire world because in today's world, uh, the smartphone allows you to do what nothing else could allow you to do before. Uh, I also want to say that uh, this forum of understanding risk is not something new. It started almost 10 years ago. And a big kudos to our technical team in, uh, uh, in the World Bank, uh, the Global Fund for Disaster Risk Reduction. I think the team is here today. Uh, again, a big, yeah, big hand to them. And also to um, our, our own technical team, uh, the, uh, the urban disaster risk management team, which is working closely together. But I have to say that uh, the Global Fund for Disaster Risk is a fund which is supported by many of you sitting here. Uh, it would not have happened had you know, governments together not provided the assistance and, and uh, trusted us and believed in us when we said we need something like this to bring the knowledge together and bring resources together. The same partners also helped us uh, to establish with, uh, with the, the Caribbean, the CRIF that you're representing. So I do want to, uh, but never do I want to extol the, uh, the work alone of the World Bank because this is something that we do together with everybody else. Uh, I know that we are sitting at the cusp of the hurricane season right now, which is starting. Uh, so it is an important time to take stock, to, to, to look at really uh, issues of risk and issues of preparedness. And I don't know if many of you are aware of this, that uh, the World Bank's global knowledge on the issue of building resilience, preparedness, risk reduction, uh, early warning systems emanates from this part of the world. A lot of what we did, uh, honorable prime ministers, uh, whether it was uh, the parametric insurance facility, whether it was the catastrophic uh, uh, contingent financing drawdown uh, options that we brought in for financing, whether it was using more uh, um, uh, state-of-the-art early warning systems, started from this region. So let's stay at the top of the game. Uh, the World Cup is also starting next month, so I, want, I don't want to forget that. So on top of, and you West Indies, the second game of the World Bank is playing, played by the West Indies versus Pakistan. So I wonder who I will support now. This is now becoming a big conflict of interest for me uh, because I don't know what, I, what I'm going to do. Um, so um, in closing, I do need to, uh, I had a, a paragraph long list of uh, uh, supporters that I needed to acknowledge and I will not say all protocol observed for that because I think it's important that everyone sitting here, the media that's present here, and the political leadership that's present here knows who's uh, involved and who supported this, uh, and who's going to be actively engaged also in the coming week or so. Uh, before that, uh, uh, really a huge thanks uh, as a starting point to the government of Barbados and to the Prime Minister. I have to say that uh, when we wrote to the Prime Minister in, uh, inviting her uh, uh, for this event and also asking for her permission to host it here. I think it was within days that we got a response that really demonstrated to us your personal commitment to, to this event. Uh, and to allowing us to be here in this building, the Museum and Historical Society, and giving us uh, the extra time, because of your arrival time, to go through all the beautiful uh, artifacts that were there. Thank you for doing that. Uh, let me thank the European Union through the Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, European Union National Disaster Risk Reduction Program for providing the main financing that was essential to make this event a reality, as well as our partners in DFID UK, Canada, CRIF, SPC, HTO, Worldwide Natural Disaster Risk Management in the Cari Forum, Cloud Carib. I wasn't aware of Cloud Carib. Is someone here from Cloud Carib? Okay, we must talk about it later to know more about that. CNW Communications, Barbados Tourism and Marketing, Liat, the airline for bringing us, many of you here, uh, University of West Indies TV Global, and the University of West Indies as a whole for providing uh, venues for the technical program. And many of our delegates, 500 plus delegates from more than 20 Caribbean countries, uh, Madam Prime Minister, who are here today, uh, and uh, institutions such as Harvard University, NASA, 
the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, the OECS, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, to name some of them. Uh, thank you to everyone. A big round of applause for everyone, please. Thank you very much again uh, for allowing us to be here today, uh, Madam Prime Minister, and thank you. Yeah, so I'm Vivien Depardieu from the GFDR Innovation Lab, and I'm really passionate in uh, enabling institutions and people to use open technology and open information to uh, come up with local solutions and increase uh, resilience. So. Oh, if the slides come up. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but so we're all here today, and I think it was very well illustrated the urgency of uh, acting uh, against climate change. But we also have uh, a lot of people moving to urban areas and putting a lot of pressure on uh, land avail availability, infrastructure, and creating new risk all the time. So it's really urgent to act now to prevent creating new risk and to start using data to inform planning and, and uh, prevent this new risk. So we will need uh, hazard information. We will need to know if this hazard is changing based on uh, climate change uh, impact, where are our assets, where are our people, so that we can make decisions and more importantly, actions. So, but it's very hard to do that. It's very hard to maintain IT infrastructure. It's very hard to maintain the skill to collect the data, to use the data. And it's still hard today to access data uh, in a lot of places around the world. So how can we improve this? Well, we have several opportunities. We have a lot of new technology available from uh, all the GPS in your pocket, the, mo the cameras in your pocket, as well as kids flying drones everywhere, and then more advanced machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in parallel, we have a huge human capital with the youth population growing in most developing countries, women breaking barriers, as we saw with the Honorable Prime Minister. And we can invest really in this uh, human capital uh, and give them the tools to really rise and change from our traditional approach of data collection and using data that's very static, one-off and expensive to something that's a lot more transparent, uh, collaborative uh, and that focus on creating skills and local ownership so that then we can take those data, those, those skills, this ownership and put it together to start uh, building local actions. And even uh, beyond the resilience realm, geospatial data uh, and tools are with you every day in every pretty much sector of life and that creates a lot of opportunities for uh, uh, employment, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, saving for the public sector, for the private sector and transparency to invest. So uh, over the last year we worked in, uh, in Africa with 12 uh, different World Bank teams to integrate uh, this innovative approach and collaborative approach according to the government's priorities and the national and local government's priorities. Now, our main objective was to collect data, to build the skills and create partnerships within cities and across cities and put all of those together to start having action and put this data to use. Um, so all of these projects were starting by really anchoring locally based on the local needs, the issue being faced, which might be different from one city to another. And we've heard a lot here, for instance, about the hurricane issue, which was not an issue in some of the cities. So how can we adapt all of this approach? So then we worked with hundreds of students and thousands of citizens to train them on using uh, laptops and uh, satellite imagery to remote map, using yardstick, cell phones, drones to do in the field to gather critical information. And after eight of over 10 months, we collected more than half a million pieces of information, trained several hundred people and involved many more thousands of citizens. And we very importantly created a network across the cities that still exchanges. And so once you put this technology, those skills, those ownership together, you can start building tools which will help either national agency to see where the local issue are and where to act, to even simple participatory process where you can involve the citizen in decision about upgrading their context. So how do we take all of these lessons learned and apply them 
in the, in the Caribbean context. Does it apply? Does it not apply? Uh, how do we need to adapt it if it applies? These are some of the questions we will ask on the, in the session tomorrow. Uh, learning from some of the open cities work in similar context in small islands, but also bringing in some of the regional and national stakeholders. And from these stakeholders really working on what are the existing needs, what are the existing initiatives, and what could be built on to really create that energy as you see in all, all, all of these pictures to go ahead and, and uh, use technology and uh, other way to go to actions. And if we think it's relevant and applicable in the context here of the, of the Caribbean, we can start talking about some of the benefits we could get from that uh, initiative, and especially building a strong technical partnership across island involving youth and uh, many stakeholders. So if you want to be part of the future of geospatial information and skills and, and uh, after all, actions in the Caribbean, come Tuesday in the Cinematheque at uh, 11.40, and uh, we'll see you there.